Thanks, Jody. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. To Jody for uh, extending the invitation, and Victoria, uh, when we were out there in June, and Kathy Wilson for organizing the session, to everyone for being here, especially those of you who have come from Toronto. Uh, I appreciate you making the journey. And of course, to the Department of History and the University of Guelph for putting on this wonderful series that I'm very excited to be a part of. <coughs> My research, as Jody mentioned, focuses on the history of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And it's really uh, an institutional study of the corporation from its beginnings in November of 1936 to roughly Christmas of 1939 during the war. Alan Plon, who's one of the Board of Governors, uh, one of the fundamental people in broadcasting in the 30s, he resigns from the corporation a year before his death in 1941. But essentially he was divorced from the institution by Christmas of 1939. So that's really my end point is his departure from uh, active service with the CBC. My previous work, uh, my MA work, was radio prior to the CBC. So this particular presentation will touch a little bit on national radio prior to the corporation and the corporation's efforts to reach rural Canadians. Now, the history of early Canadian radio is really one of trying to create an east-west access in Canada, there was fears among cultural nationalists in the 1920s as radio starts to spread that Canada was becoming further Americanized and that radio was a tool that was uh, further exacerbating this problem. And, and when you put it in the context of the nationalism of the 1920s, as Canada emerges from the First World War, and really for the first time people are starting to try and separate from the British identity that had defined Canada for so long. So in that context, radio is seen by some as a way to unite the nation, and incorporating rural Canada was critical to that process because the system, a national radio system that did not include the entire country, would actually be counterproductive because it would further uh, regionalize the country. They, that, that was the fear. Uh, and given that so many people live in such close proximity to the American border, there was a sense that if we further divide the country regionally, uh, the, the north-south pull that had already been so strong would just uh, further, would continue to strengthen to the point that Canada would just be an American state. So it, it could actually be argued then that rural Canada was prioritized ahead of urban Canada in this process because urban Canada was already well served by radio stations. Radio in the 1920s, most stations were owned by newspapers and they were local. Uh, and newspapers own them because they wanted to protect their own revenue streams. There was a sense that if, if other people owned stations, advertisers would go to radio instead of newspapers. So newspapers own, just started creating the stations, bought the stations to protect their advertising revenues. But because radio was so localized in nature, it didn't really do anything to speak to a nation. It was more speaking to cities. And this caused a problem for some cultural nationalists. And this appeared in McLean's magazine in 1924 by Elton Johnson. He wrote that radio needed to do more to promote national unity by writing the result of exclusive local broadcasting is that the Ontario fan, as far as radio education goes, retains his Ontario point of view with only an occasional interruption from speakers and artists in other provinces. So again, it's this idea that it's impossible to create a national consensus without everybody in the country involved in the process. And this was really shown through major national events. The 1927 Jack Dempsey Gene Tunney heavyweight fight in September of that year was one example. 55 stations across North America linked together to create a network to broadcast the fight. And it was a famous fight because the year before they had a famous short count fight um, where the referee counted to nine, but he didn't start the count until the guy was down for every five seconds. It was a controversial fight, and this was the rematch. And there's stories of people in places like Yorkton, Saskatchewan, which is just outside of Regina, huddling together in garages uh, to be able to pick up or to be able to listen to this fight. So it's the start of radio as a community event where people can get together, listen to big national broadcasts. Uh, another example of this is the Jubilee, Diamond Jubilee broadcast in 1927 on uh, Dominion Day, where the CNR radio network linked the country together to broadcast the events from Ottawa. So there's this idea that radio is a medium through which people can be brought together. Uh, in 1927, the government establishes the Aired Commission with the hope that a national system could be created. 
the Air Commission traveled through the United States and through Europe and then across the country, uh, getting feedback on what a national system should look like. And the commission recommended that Canada establish a national broadcasting system set up or established by the federal government. Uh, The Hamilton Spectator reported on this and hoped that it would, quote, bring the sister provinces closer together. That report comes out in 1929, and a few months later, in October, you have the finance or the uh, stock market crash, and then in the summer of 1930, there's a federal election and a change of government. R.B. Bennett and the Conservatives win the 1930 election, and this report, which was obviously commissioned with Mackenzie King and the Liberals, gets pushed aside for more pressing issues. But then the 1931 Christmas broadcast happens, or I guess more accurately, doesn't happen. The idea for the 1931 Christmas broadcast was that the BBC wanted to do an empire-wide broadcast. And every country would have its own part to play and actually contribute to the broadcast. And it was decided that Canada's contribution would be to broadcast Niagara Falls. Um, Not from Niagara Falls, but broadcast the falls. So you just put a microphone next to the the waterfalls and people would listen to it. Um, To do that, though the signal needed to go through a transmitter in New York State. And to get the signal there, it had to go through AT&T wirelines. And because the broadcast in Canada was covered by Bell, AT&T refused to do this because Bell was a competitor. So AT&T said, we're not going to do this. The BBC said, if we can't get a Canadian component to this broadcast, we're not going to do it. And the whole thing fell apart. Now, R.B. Bennett, I think, is a miscast figure in history I really like him. I've written a piece about how his, the, the, the idea of him as, as this austere aristocrat who is detached is really unfair, and that his drive in entering politics was uh, this, this push to public service. And if anything, he almost cared too much about Canadians and the, the, sort of the average Canadian, the plight of them in the Depression. Uh, and as a staunch nationalist, this failure to get a signal to the BBC was very embarrassing for him. So that really was the impetus to R.B. Bennett and the Conservatives to push for uh, national radio and his fear that the Americans had too much influence over Canadian affairs. And you can see where he's coming from. This is a map that was printed in Saturday night in 1931 showing the coverage of Canadian of radio in Canada. Uh, and this was accompanied by separate pieces one by Graham Spry and another one from a representative of the Canadian Association of Broadcasters debating the merits of a national system. So you can see that this big, scary semicircles are uh, its American coverage, uh, or American stations coverage in Canada, and the circles, the full circles, are Canadian coverage. So you can see that the urban, traditionally urban areas, particularly the Windsor-Quebec City corridor, is very well covered with Canadian stations. Uh, as are the principal centers in the prairies and on the two coasts. But the, where the problem is, is that there's significant gaps in the coverage from, call it, Sault Ste. Marie to west of Thunder Bay, uh, in the prairies from Moose Jaw to Lethbridge, we'll call it. Um, and then in British Columbia, there's huge swaths that are not covered. Now, British Columbia is a, a distinct case because of the topography. Um, but you can see that what the whole, what you would call the settled area of Canada is covered by American stations, and the same is not true for Canadian stations. So this was a great concern to people like Arby Bennett and other cultural nationalists. And the debate over a national radio network really came down to an urban, to some extent came down to an urban-rural argument because there was tension between urban and rural Canadians on this issue. Many urban Canadians felt that if we were to have a national system, it would be urban Canada paying for it, paying for rural Canadians to have access. One of the things in the Air Commission was a proposal that there would be a license fee on all radios to pay for a national network. Urban Canada felt that, well, we already have our service. Now you're going to implement a fee on us to give service to other people. Uh, And they felt that that wasn't fair. Similar accusations were actually thrown around uh, later in the decade while television was in its experimental phase. A 1937 article in the Montreal Gazette claimed that urban areas were being deprived of television just because urban er or urban areas were being deprived because rural areas didn't have access. So that tension continued to exist through the decade. And despite the tension, though, 
both the Canadian Radio League, which was the principal lobby group uh, supporting public broadcasting, and the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, which is the association that continues to represent uh, the majority of private broadcasters, both tried to convince the government that their proposed system for a national radio network was the best because it would best reach rural listeners. The CRL, uh, the Canadian Radio League, earned the support of people like Doc Dr. Edward Malpetit, who is the Secretary General, General of the University of Montreal, uh, Hector McInnes, uh, and of course Graham Spry was one of the founders, uh, and he had great connections from the Canadian clubs in the 1920s. Similarly, the Canadian Association of Broadcasters tried to align with the Western Association of Broadcasters to show how their system would help rural listeners. It was generally felt, however, that the Canadian Association of Broadcasters was handicapped because they were too centralized in Toronto and Montreal. So the Canadian Radio League system won out, and in 1932, the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission was established, and this was the first public broadcaster in Canada. Bennett thought that this would help bridge the gap between urban and rural Canadians. He wrote to Hector Charlesworth in 1932 that it does not seem right that in Canada the town should be preferred to the countryside or the prosperous communities to those less fortunate. Happily, however, under this system there is no need for discrimination. All may be served alike. And that's a wonderful thought, but it's not actually what happened the CRBC was a three-person executive. Hector Charlesworth was the one and only chairman, and the two original vice chairmen were Thomas Mayer and Arthur Steele. The principal problem with the commission was that it was designed to serve as a programmer and a regulator at the same time. So while it's broadcasting and creating programs, it's also regulating private stations. And uh, for obvious reasons, I think private stations had a, a major problem with this. They felt it was a, a conflict of interest. Another problem for the CRBC was that it had to have programs of national interest, and it supplemented its schedule with American programs. This meant that it could not cater to regional interests. For example, three to four hours a week were broadcast in French. In Saskatchewan, this was not received very well. There were significant protests in the province. Regina MP Frank Turnbull complained that the CBC was, quote, undermining its own purpose to foster unity by broadcasting French. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was particularly active in the province, uh, particularly in places like Moose Jaw in the 1930s. And in 1934, as Hector Charlesworth was on a national tour, he met with the Klan while he was in Regina to try and calm tensions. So the problem wasn't just with French, though. It was also because the programs were interfering with the popular American features at the time. A 1934 Regina Daily Star article found that, after hockey, of course, Jack Benny was the most popular program in the city. Amos and Andy was a, a particularly popular program. There are stories of, in the 1930s, in the summer, if you walked down a street in Urban Center, you could listen to Amos and Andy as you walked because everybody would have the show on and would have their windows open. So you could just listen to it as you walked down the street. And it's also important to remember that in the 1930s, people are particularly passionate about radio because of the medium's importance during the Depression. Radio was one of the few industries that was growing in the 1930s, and it gave people a sense of escape from the hardships associated with the 1930s. Susan Douglas has called it a saving grace and it, that it gave people an innocent optimism during the decade. And despite the economic realities of the, 30, of the 30s, there was also a sense that radio could pay for itself. This is perhaps the, my favorite thing that I found uh, in the archives. It's a letter to the CBC from 1938 by a guy named David Gray, who's from Brockville, Ontario. He wrote to say, that Time and again, my wife has said she would rather listen into your program than go to the show. I don't believe she goes to the show once a month, but if she did not have your program, she would be at the show at least once a week. Then you can see the radio is a good money saver, too. You can trust the Scott to see a good bargain, and to get so fine programs through the CBC for $2 is a bargain. Why, laddie, it's a gift. So people are, are really invested in radio and in the national system. So when it doesn't work, people get upset. People are mad. And it's also part of a larger uh, cultural expansion 
During the 1930s, things like the Dominion Drama Festival and the National Film Board are also created in the 1930s. And these are important, particularly in the rural areas, because it connects rural Canadians to a wider world, while also providing information that is essential, uh, or at least useful, to their, to their lives. You can get weather updates during the drought. You can get wheat price updates or livestock price updates. You can get fishing condition updates on the coasts. So this ability, so there's this ability or this hope that you can provide this information for rural Canadians while still achieving the goal of a national uh, network. And the CRBC felt it was doing this quite well. Its 1934 annual report wrote that by the daily exchange of radio programs between East and West, the geographical barrier of distance is being surmounted, and in this way there tends to be a disappearance of parochialism and the development of a vigorous national perspective. Obviously, national radio is an effective instrument in nation building. Of course, part of that is reaching rural Canadians. So in 1934, for the 1934-1935 season, the radio season is the same way that network television continues to run their seasons from the fall to the spring. For that 34-35 season, they put together a farm-related program. And it's important, though, to keep in mind that this seems to be the idea of outside influences and not coming from within the commission itself, despite all its claims that it wants to reach everybody. The following year, for example, for the 35-36 season, Fred James at the Department of Agriculture was the one who spearheaded the farm broadcasts. He was working with Ernest Bushnell from the programming department to arrange a series of broadcasts whereby the Department of Agriculture would provide the contents, the information, and the CRBC would write the scripts, would provide the creative uh, part of the process. But there were different interests in different regions. So if these programs were to be national, how do you speak to the various concerns of rural Canadians across the country? So when Ernest Bushnell took the, pres the plan to regional program directors, the response was that the idea was not satisfactory. Bushnell wrote to Fred James in June of 1935 to say that Mr. Willis of the Maritimes pointed out that the farmers in his part of the country were not at all interested in the problems of the wheat growers of the prairie provinces, and Mr. Stoven of Western Canada argued similarly, similarly that farmers on the prairies would not listen to information regarding problems of the fruit growers of the Maritimes or British Columbia. Despite these concerns, and in part because the technology, they did not have the technology to broadcast regionally, they went with a series of national broadcasts aimed at a general agrarian audience. And the title of, the title of the series was Romance and Dividends in Agriculture. So you can see here's the 1935-1936 season and some of the titles that were there. So great national organization. Britain's Need, Canada's Opportunity, A Good Tip on Horses, uh, Poultry, there was a cooking one. So you can see that a lot of the national programs tried to reduce rural issues into a singular framework, which is, of course, difficult to do. There are four exceptions that were regional. Regrassy and prairie farmlands, fruit diseases in their control, how soil drifting injures farmlands permanently, and there is a fourth. BC, BC, yes, BC can have fine pastures. So those were the four regional ones. But generally, these are national programs. The programs aired Sundays at noon, and the scripts were sent to each region so that they were broadcast at noon in the region. So you have an announcer at a station in BC or Alberta, or Saskatchewan, whatever, to read the script at that time. The problem with that, though, is that you are relying on the individual stations to broadcast the content. It's not CRBC. It's private stations who are receiving these scripts and then are responsible for broadcasting them. So the CRBC really loses a good deal of control in doing that. Now, there's not a lot of data on how these programs were received by farmers, uh, but at least in BC, it was found that the time period was not working. The Vancouver Daily Province had a news program in the afternoon. So as a result, in January of 1936, the BC Romance and Dividends broadcast was shifted to 5.45 on Sunday afternoons because the Vancouver Daily Province's news program was so popular. 
that this followed that, uh, that program. At the end of the season, the CRBC was generally pleased with the series, despite some issues with paying announcers uh, and making sure that all the broadcasts went out on time. And there was a hope that the series would continue. Fred James was hopeful that uh, it would happen, despite the fact that the Department of Agriculture wasn't particularly keen on the idea initially. He had been pressured within the House of Commons to have this program continue. Through the summer of 1936, however, the federal government passed legislation to replace the CRBC with the CBC, uh, and there are a lot of issues associated with why that happened. But through the summer, the commission was not making plans for a fall season, and the corporation was kind of making plans for the fall season, but rural programming uh, did not make it into the cut. So for as much as this was a useful program and helpful and maybe set a precedent for the CBC to work with later, it didn't really have this legacy that influenced or informed broadcasting later. Perhaps the biggest legacy of the CRBC in terms of rural broadcasting is the Northern Messenger Service. This aired Saturday nights in the winter from October through April usually. And it was messages to northern communities and it would broadcast over 2,000 messages a year. And it was popular with both northern and southern audiences. And I've listened to a few of these that they have at the archives in Ottawa. And it literally is just I think 200 word messages. So it would be like John Smith in Yellowknife, went to dinner at the club, had dinner with the, the Joneses, hope all is well, love mom and dad. Like it would be those sorts of messages because that was the only form of communication because mail service was interrupted during the winter. So this was a replacement for telegrams or other mail services. And it was a really popular series and it's described, the CBC described it in a 1976 promotional piece as the biggest party line in the world. And that's really what it was. Ultimately though, there had to be a separation between regional and national interests. And the CRBC could not do that regularly because it didn't have the equipment or the money to do it. So the CBC takes over from the CRBC on November the 2nd of 1936, and there are sweeping organizational and structural changes, one of which is to divide the country into five regions, which is the Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario, the Prairies, and British Columbia. And the mandate, of course, was to serve as a national broadcaster. And to achieve that goal, the CBC's initial focus was to expand the network. Programming was not a primary concern for the CBC early on. This created significant tension between C.D. Howe, the Minister of Transport, and uh, the Board of Governors, because Howe felt as though programming should be improved before technical uh, improvements. Uh, ultimately, though, the Board of Governors won out, and it was the technology that was the initial focus. And one of the first decisions in terms of programming was not to renew romance and dividends in agriculture. Fred James had met with Gladstone Murray, who was the general manager of the CBC in November of 1936. And both sides were open to doing something, but there was no space. There was a feeling that there was no space in the schedule. Uh, the corporation planned on moving to a 12-hour schedule in the fall of 1937. There was a hope that they could do something at that point. There was a thought in the spring of 1937 of putting together a daily morning program at 7.30 that would serve primarily to inform people of agricultural prices, whether livestock, produce, whatever. And the CBC canvassed private stations to see if they would be interested. But there were problems because many of the stations weren't on the air at 7.30 in the morning, therefore wouldn't air the program. And French language stations in Quebec said that they wouldn't broadcast it if it was an English language program, which I think is a rather reasonable response. So this highlighted one of the main issues of the network that the CBC had, was that it was difficult to broadcast regionally because there was so much reliance on private stations to broadcast the content. So the CBC immediately got to work on renegotiating its wireline contract with the Canadian National Railroad, the New Canadian Pacific Railroad, who were the primary owners of the, the wirelines, and they re renegotiated to a lower cost per hour. Uh, it was a larger total amount, but they were getting more hours of wireline time. So you could expand the 12 and then later 18 hour schedule. So your price per hour was lowered uh, exponentially. 
And it allowed really for the best of both worlds because now you could regionally broadcast to reach rural listeners with local information while also including them in national broadcasts or broadcasts of national concern. Because in rural areas, there's a sense that city broadcasts were, were well received because they quenched a thirst for, quote, something beyond the familiar landscape and the rituals of working and social life. But it had to be part of a broader programming structure whereby local programs and content was supplemented through national content. Uh, the CBC went to work building transmitters in 1937. In December of 1937, they completed transmitters in uh, Verchere, Quebec, and then Hornby, Ontario, which is just near here. And in 1939, Sackville, New Brunswick, and Watrous, Saskatchewan. These were large, uh, high-power regional transmitters that could reach a majority of listeners in these regions. So this allows the CBC, the, they own now these stations and have complete control over them, so they can do these regional broadcasts without relying on private stations. I also want to note, too, that for the corporation, rural and agrarian were synonymous. There doesn't seem to be much distinction between rural Canadians who were miners or fishers. Uh, there was some information for fishers, but primarily agrarian and rural were synonyms. So for the CBC, when it tries to service rural Canada, it tries to do so with agrarian-related programming. Now, it doesn't come up with this all on its own. It does send a guy by the name of William Ward on a survey to do a survey in 1937. And he interviews 684 rural families in the West to see what their radio preferences are. And he found that peak times for listening in the winter were 6 to 9 in the morning, 11.30 to 1.30 in the afternoon, and then 6 to 10 at night. In the summer, the lunchtime period was the same. The morning period goes away, and the evening period pushes back a half hour and then ends an hour and a half earlier. And you can see the, the reason for that would be that in the morning you're out working uh, and saying you're not going to listen as late at night so you can go to sleep. Um, but that midday period is what jumped out to the CBC. Uh, rural listeners also universally praised news coverage, news service, and 56% of listeners favored talks programs, so more informational-based programming. And there was a feeling that music could not usurp the place of the spoken word on radio. This is from the report that uh, Ward wrote. He wrote, quote, Radio is now at or has passed the turning point in the direction of the spoken word as the desire to change from the perpetual music used so incessantly since the advent of broadcasting. So these people want information. They want discussion. They want something that is going to enrich their experience on the, uh, as rural Canadians. Now, the most significant thing that perhaps comes out of this report is the growing consciousness that radio can be used for educational purposes. And this does not just stand for providing information for farmers, but also for school-age children. CJOC Lethbridge, for example, had an educational broadcast, and 107 rural schools had bought radios to listen to it. In Regina, the Board of Education had a music appreciation broadcast on Friday afternoons, and 29 rural schools had signed up for these. And there, there was reports that more schools would sign up if a reliable educational service was available. And you can see here, these are children in British Columbia who are participating, who are leading an educational broadcast. This is a music one. So the kids are around leading the broadcast. And here's one from Toronto where kids are listening to, uh, I believe it's a story time type story, Tales from Far and Near. So the CBC is presented with this information that people want, rural Canadians want educational programming, but the there needs to be a reliable service for it. Alan Plott from the Board of Governors got to work with Frank Underhill, history professor at the University of Toronto, to develop something for Ontario. R.J. Willis, who was the superintendent of education in B.C., and Robert England, who was the chairman of the CBC's Western Advisory Council, they got together and started working together to try and figure out how to get educational broadcast into schools. The main problem, though, for the CBC was one of jurisdiction. 
the CBC as a national institution legally can't get involved in education as a provincial, uh, which is provincial. And this is particularly true in, say, the East Coast. You have a transmitter that's in New Brunswick, but it serves the whole region. So if you have an educational broadcast, do you have maybe three a day, one for Nova Scotia, one for PEI, one for New Brunswick, or do you try and amalgamate the three boards of, or the three departments of education into one broadcast? Same situation on the prairies, where you have the one transmitter serving the three provinces. So this was a major issue for the CBC. But by the war, by the start of the war in 1939, each region had developed a daytime educational broadcast for schools. Um, in British Columbia, 170 schools were registered. In Alberta, between 150 and 200 schools. Uh, in Manitoba, 5,500 students were being reached by this service. And there's a sense that it's rather a rather successful program. This is a quote from Edward Pickering in his report on school broadcasting in 1939, writing that the most important contribution to be made of school made by school broadcasting in Canada is to the smaller and less prosperous communities, which are in some cases completely isolated except by radio, and in most cases are without the advantages of the wealthier urban schools in the way of libraries, scientific apparatus, and the general urban atmosphere of plays and concerts. So again, there's a sense that by providing this service through the expansion of the network, coordinating with provincial boards of education, that the CBC is reaching rural listeners in a way that they had not been reached before. And so really education is at the forefront of programming for rural listeners. But the core of the programming, of course, is still going to be aimed at farmers. The CBC wanted to institute agricultural programs that would be applicable to cattle ranchers or wheat farmers or fruit farmers, whatever it was. And they did a survey that showed that 35% of radio homes in Canada were in rural areas. So there was a further push to serve these people. In March of 1938, the MP for Stormont, Ontario, wrote to Bob Bowman, who worked in the tox department, to let him know that farmers in his riding were, uh, were starting to agitate for rural programming, or for farming programming, particularly the information that they got during the CRBC era. Bowman responded that the CBC was working with the Department of Agriculture to try and get something going, but they weren't really sure about when it would start. The Department of Agriculture was given some 15-minute time slots through 1938 to... To, to give agricultural talks. But the series that so many people had hoped for, sort of this revival of what the CRBC had done, but on a more regional scale, had not happened. Because for the CBC, this being successful really depended on the regional aspect. So with the completion of the transmitters and the, the opening up of the schedule to a 12 and 18 hour schedule, this allows for regional agricultural programming. And the first one was in Quebec, actually, with Rural Revival, or uh, Revive Rural, which started in 1938 as a daily program that was broadcast on the French network. There were two networks in Quebec, an English language network and a French language network. So this program was only on the French network. The organization that provided a lot of the content for the, uh, for the show was headed by a guy named George Bouchard, who was a liberal MP in uh, for Quebec. And this caused some tension with uh, people in Ottawa that they felt he was trying to be too political with the program. But in general, the program was well-received because it was primarily information-based for, again, these uh, livestock prices, uh, produce prices, etc. And it started the tradition of noontime broadcasts agricultural broadcasts in each region. And by 1940, each region had its own version, with uh, British Columbia being the final one. The key to these programs was providing timely information that allowed farmers to make money or to best capitalize on their products. So there could be updates and changing prices, which would allow them to get true value for their produce. Each program despite being produced regionally, had the same format. It started with 
10 minutes of market quotes, and you had 10 minutes of a dramatic sketch. Uh, this would be usually a family setting in a rural atmosphere, talking or, or living through the issues that confronted uh, rural Canadians. The Craig family in Ontario was perhaps the most popular of these. And the last 10 minutes was devoted to news, and news compri was comprised primarily of weather, uh, because again, it's this notion of what's important to the agrarian Canadian. Now, there's no accurate ratings to go off of. Uh, rating systems in the 1930s were, were non-existent for the most part. There were a couple that tried to have uh, tried to generate ratings, but they were noted, no, uh, notoriously inaccurate. So the way the CBC judges or judged its uh, audience reach was through people writing in. And the response from farmers was generally positive. Uh, there was a letter from George Hay, who was a livestock producer from Vancouver, wrote the quote, Canada is primarily an agricultural country, and a healthy appreciation and respect for country life is vital to the contentment of Canadian people. The all too prevalent grumbling and dissatisfaction, unemployment, etc., and this agricultural country is accounted for in no small measure to the lack of appreciation for country living by Canadian people. The loss of old-time pride and satisfaction in country living presents the problem today of developing a better attitude towards agriculture. Only renewed appreciation for country living will bring about a national back-to-the-land movement and consequent re-established pride in home development and self-sustenance. Now, bringing back that sense of pride can also be seen in the development of farm radio forum. And I, I know that Ruth has, has done work on this, so um, I, I don't know how much I'll be able to add, but I'll try my best to, to add some to, to what she's done. And the goal of the program, Farm Radio Forum, was to establish or set up a national discussion of farmers between farmers on farm issues. So it was sponsored jointly by the CBC, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, and the Canadian Association of Adult Education. It officially started in 1941, and it was a series of actuality programs uh, broadcast on farming. And what made the program particularly unique was the, that it tried to engage in a two-way communication with its listeners. So the associations would put out written material for farmers to read and organize listening parties and here's an example of one. It's, uh, so you can see, here's your schedule for the forum. And here's a sample program for what you need to do when you're hosting the party. Uh, it has the whole timeline laid out from 8 to 11. So you get people together, you have games, you sing. Uh, the secretary gets together, who's going to take notes. Uh, they get prepared. Uh, you tune in the radio five minutes before the show is supposed to start. Then you listen. Then you engage in debates uh, about the topic, about what's being discussed, with the secretary recording what's going on uh, because the CBC wants you to send it into them. Uh, the group uh, talks together. The last thing that you do is you figure out who's hosting next week. And then uh, once you're done, you can serve a light lunch uh, if you want to. Uh, you don't have to, but you may serve a light lunch at 11. In addition to providing the outline for the party, it would produce, uh, there would be a production of these newsletters that would have the facts or provide information relevant to that week's broadcast. So here's an example. I'll go through it. There, there's several pages to it, but this is all one issue uh, from February of 1943. So debt menaces the family farm. So the topic that week would have been debt uh, in rural Canada. And here it provides all sorts of different statistics. Who owns farms, who partly owns farms, rented farms, uh, the, the different problems associated with this. More information, you have your questions, your three questions for forum discussion that will make up the primary basis of your talk following the program or your discussion following the program. And then another page, again, with more information. And there's the fun part there. So these things are used or designed to supplement what's going on on the broadcast. So you go in to listen to the broadcast and you're already familiar with what's going to be discussed and you've formed your own opinion 
on the topic for that week. And what the broadcast is intended to do is to just spur that discussion. As a result, this is from a, a CBC uh, agriculture promotional piece in 1941. Thus the project becomes a two-way communication. First the broadcast and the study material reach in the farm homes with the facts that are the tools of thought. Then in discussion, the farm people up and down the ranges, concessions, and road allowances of Canada put their minds to work on the problems of agriculture and their solutions. They make known their findings to the other provinces, to the whole of Canada. This is a democratic method. It invites people not only to listen, but to question, criticize, and discuss what they hear. Further, it expects some kind of responsible action to result from such deliberation. So in a lot of ways, this is the CBC's effort to engage in social media. Uh, at its worst today, social media is, is very ego-driven and, and very self-centered. But at its best, social media is engaging with a wider community to have critical discussions about the issues that face that you're facing in your life. And that's what the CBC is trying to accomplish with the Farm Radio Forum. Now, you could also look at it in a more sinister light, if you want, as this is the CBC's effort to convince people of its own efforts, to legitimize its efforts at nationwide broadcasting. The CBC struggled through its early years to get people on board and to get support. So you could look at this as an effort to almost indoctrinate people by in showing the value of a national institution. Um, I might fall somewhere in the middle of those two extremes on, on where I sit on, on this issue. Because I think there is a real service in trying to engage in these discussions, and particularly when you don't have ratings or really an accurate measure to determine audience size and reaction, that soliciting response like this is perhaps the best way to do that and therefore improve your programming, improve your offerings, uh, and actually reach people in a way that they want to be reached, speak to the issues that they're concerned about. So there is there is utility in this, and whether or not the farmers themselves felt this utility, that's something that uh, uh, I think Ruth, again, would be more familiar with because she's familiar with the discussions right, that, that actually took place. But if you put the farm radio form into the larger context of the CBC's early efforts, you can see how the corporation targeted rural Canadians as a means to serve the country and bring everybody together through a national service. Therefore, in its early years, the CBC expanded and developed its offerings to rural Canadians as part of its efforts to legitimize its operations and grow the national network. And internally, the corporation felt that it had done this and made a significant contribution in bringing the country together. Um, I, I really like that when the CBC celebrates itself like this. Um, it, one, it doesn't do it very often. Uh, and two, they tend to do it in uh, very much a self-aggrandizing way, and somewhat over the top. And I think this quote is an example of that. Quote, a few short years ago, many an outland farm community was, in reality, a thousand miles from the city. Today, the geography is unchanged, but the distance between city and the farthest reaches of the country has been bridged by national radio. For the first time in the history of Canada, the far-flung fringes of Canadian agriculture have been brought into daily touch with the latest developments in farming in the oldest communities. Not only have people moved closer together, but each day a nation of farm and city listeners is unified by radio. And it's not necessarily unfounded, this, this claim. Uh, if you remember back to that map that I showed at the start, here's the map of the corporation's nighttime coverage in August of 1940. Daytime coverage wasn't as good. Um, but here's your nighttime coverage. And you can see how the coverage has expanded from what it was in 1931. The prairies are all covered, uh, again, settled area, if you will, through Ontario and Quebec, the entire Maritimes. Um, British Columbia remains kind of a mess. Uh, even today, uh, British Columbia is difficult to cover with terrestrial radio just because of the topography. Uh, you need, I think the CBC has more local stations in British Columbia than anywhere else in the country, uh, just because it's so hard to get a signal to carry in British Columbia. But again, you can see that it's expanded significantly from where it was in 1931. So these claims that it's bringing the country together are not necessarily unfounded, while at the same time it can serve these local or regional interests because it has the regional transmitters. 
So in a way, you can argue that the CBC is bringing people together, or, or at least able to bring people together, by making sure that we're keeping them apart. So the problems that befell the commission with having to broadcast French nationally or regional concerns nationally, CBC is now immune from those same concerns. So from improving the technology to providing educational material to, to engaging in an interactive program, the CBC attempted to bring rural Canadians into a national system as a means to promote the utility of national broadcasting. And if the CBC was to serve Canada, it had to serve all Canadians. And perhaps those in the rural areas were the ones who most benefited from this mindset. Thank you.